I'll say um, I'll say welcome to the land use subcommittee of the Conservation Commission on November 5th, and we're starting a little late, 1219. Sorry, we had technical difficulties. And we have an agenda uh, that's been published that has a number of items on it, which we're going to try to go through. We're going to run to 130. The first item was our dog policy uh, in consideration of commission comments. And I'm going to ask Erin if she can bring that up. Otherwise, I'll go find it. And also, I'll say that number two was condition 19, and item three was condition 20 of those rules. And uh, the entire set of rules was was revised. So we'll go through all of it, I hope. And thank you, by the way, to uh, Michelle. You got on this like Monday at pretty close to 8 o'clock. Bruce looked at it. All your comments are in there. Thank you very much for that. And sorry for the misspellings. Can you make it larger, please? So I'm going to go down. If we could just scroll down, I'm familiar with it, and I don't have any questions. We do have questions on the side, like the first one's Bruce. And if we could go down through and answer the comments and raise any other issues that people have, uh, we can probably um, do it fairly quickly. I gave this 20 minutes. We'll see. So um, at the top, it starts with the introduction. And Bruce had a question there. He has he's in the process of uh, getting a better definition for um, permaculture, which is in the definition section. Thank you, Bruce. Working on it. I sent an email. Yeah, and the comment is reverse order. Um, so, um, Alex, sorry, before you go on, the, the one that's above that is about the uh, Native Land Acknowledgement question. And I went to the Connecticut River Partnership meeting, and there was some discussion about that, and there was a couple of people who were deeply knowledgeable about that. And so I would be open to uh, taking on to contact them and find out. And it was clear from the discussion that increasingly written um, land acknowledgements are increasingly fraught. So um, we want to have something, but I'd be willing to fairly rapidly connect with the partnership and find that person and discuss it with them. And maybe they could even come to a meeting and talk with us. So I'll, I will take that on. Could you also maybe reach out to um, the Kestrel Trust? Because Kestrel has done a lot of research in this area. Sure. They're, they're actually a land holder. They they own and manage hundreds and hundreds of acres of conservation land. Could, sure. you, could you or Michelle, I know Michelle has experience in this arena. I'm, I'm curious I, because I just don't know enough. Of, fraught with what? Um, um, well, they've gotten quite long and complicated. There's a almost five paragraph version of it for, that, that UMass Fine Arts reads in, at the beginning of every um, concert or dance performance. Um, and it was done with Native American, deep date Native American engagement, but others are saying these are too long. It's, it's not, it's just too, it, this isn't appropriate. So there's a lot of, been a lot of discussion over the last two or three years. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think Michelle brought this up for quite a while ago and that's, that's where this initial yeah, um, I mean, it is interesting that it's probably evolved a bit, as Bruce has noted, since I even put this comment in. So yeah. um, whatever. I mean, I know of a short one that, like, 
UMass presenters use for any kind of presentation? Yeah. Well, anyway, I will, I will take, I'm very interested in the question. I'm willing to be in charge of helping right. get to the, figure out what to do. Thanks, Bruce. Sure. Can you uh, jump for Michelle? Yeah, input? absolutely. Thank you. Done with that one? Uh, I just thought values should come before functions. It doesn't really matter to me. I'm fine with that. Doesn't make any difference to me. Functions and values is the way I usually see it. That's how I wrote it. Um, or maybe somebody else wrote that. I can't put my finger on it to see who wrote it. Aaron, Aaron can do that. I don't really care. We can we can switch around. Okay. okay, Aaron, moving down. If somebody has, if we come to another comment, we'll stop. And if somebody has a comment about anything in there as we move down, please say something. This is Michelle here. Um, <clears throat> I'm not suggesting a change. I'm merely pointing out that we don't even list dog walking as a passive recreational use, which frankly, I would agree with that it's not exactly that passive. And um, in my work, we stopped using passive recreation use altogether because really all recreation has impacts. Um, but we're listing all of these very human-centric things, whereas um, I think Dave's noted that one of the primary uses of the conservation lands is places for people to walk their dogs. So um, I don't know if it's, I don't, it's obviously not intentional. I'm just wondering, do we acknowledge that that's a passive recreational use that is um, acknowledged by the Conservation Commission. I mean, it it is the reality, right? I, I I would hazard a guess that certainly more than fifty percent of the people using our lands are walking their dogs. I don't I don't have any data to support that, but anecdotally, I think that is true. So why wow. wouldn't why wouldn't we acknowledge that? Given that, I would drop passive and include uh, dog walking as one of the topics. I'm not get... saying I'm not saying we should drop passive because it's still meaningful to a lot of people. It just means, um, I mean, it, it means things like you know not hunting or you know, it means something. So I don't think we should drop it. it that's sort of more nuanced than I think this list needs. Okay. But... Well, I think we should include dog walking and it gets addressed a lot later on, so. Yeah. yeah. Maybe on like leashed dog walking. There we go. Hmm. I, I, we have exceptions in there. So if we define dog walking, it gets a little, a little hairy. Well, then we you could know, just leave it as is, but. I'm getting I, audio through my microphone system, even though I'm supposed to be on mute. Um, it occurs to me that you don't buy or acquire land for the purpose of providing canoeing, cross country skiing, or any of these. They are ancillary to the acquisition of conservation land. The, they are permitted, allowed, and you guys getting an echo. Yeah, but it's okay. I can't hear you now. Yeah, I can't hear you either, Alex. Can you now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Much clearer. Um, so there are ancillary uses. Um, we certainly spend money building trails to allow for them. I just go with whatever Dave thinks is right. So what I heard him say is it's 50% of users probably walk their dogs. And I heard Bruce say eliminate passive and put in walking dogs. Um, and then I heard don't, don't, don't remove passive. So. Um, I think that's fine. 
I think we should include dog walk, dog leashed dog walking. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. You want to add that, Aaron? I moved things around so that they were in alphabetical order. Um, that was. All right, so she's going to make that small change. It sounds like it. Okay, moving along. Mm -hmm. Do we want to keep scrolling down, Aaron? So I looked into um, commercial use. Can you go up a little bit? Sorry, how where, could you tell me where you want me to go, Alex? Because when you say go up a My little bit. My comment there about fee structure. I think it refers to um, commercial use. But anyways, the fee structure in another part of the policy document lists what the fees are going to be for all kinds of activities, weddings, and it and it also lists uh, activities that are going to be charged a fee. One of them is movie making, filming. Um, and what I did was I somewhere maybe it's here. I I moved those in. So I was trying to clear up the conflict between what's said in the fee structure section. <clears throat> It's a fee structure for land use applications, number six conflicts. And what I chose to do was move the examples that are in the fee structure section into this rules and regulations. So that's all. I don't need. Um, The next comment has to do with horseback riding. Are there signs or will there be signs where horseback riding and bike mountain bikes are allowed? Hmm. I don't recall that we've talked much about those two uses. I'm much less concerned about horseback riding simply because it's not a a significant, in, well, there just aren't that many horses that ride on our trails, except on maybe the Mount Holyoke Range. Mountain bikes, on the other hand, a lot of mountain bikers now use our trails. Historically, before I got here, um, there used to be signs uh, that designated which trails could be mountain biked on. Uh, and then there were really fine, I mean, there was... You got into the weeds, the previous rules, maybe they're the current rules we even have because we're redoing them here. Um, they they had, this trail is closed during wet conditions in April and May. And, you know, it was like, who's, who's even going to enforce this? I mean, it just got into such fine detail. I thought it was kind of absurd. Um, but we haven't talked much about mountain bikes. I don't know if anyone on this committee has strong opinions about them. They are much more... Um, much more prominent now on our trails than they ever were before, just with the um, um, uh, popularity of, of the of the of the activity and the fact that the Mount Holyoke Range is kind of a little bit of a local mecca for mountain bikers. So, a lot of the trails up there are used pretty extensively. My thoughts on mountain bikes, um, and and this, I think it appears later on. But anyways, my concern about mountain bikes is that. If they go fast and they come over a hill, they could encounter hikers very quickly and have an accident. There was an incident in Glacier National Park where a park ranger and his girlfriend were, were using mountain bikes and went flying over a hill and, and came down into a black bear with 
with cubs and they were both killed. We're not going to have probably that situation here, but there was an example of where there was a safety issue. So mm -hmm. my concern is has more to do with mountain bikes being able to maintain control if they encounter hikers. And I, so if there are, if you want to reduce the con the potential for conflict, then regulate where they can be. I don't, I, I'm not going to follow my sword about it. Is it correct that the commission vice chair is the most knowledgeable and and directly interested person on the commission about this question. Ooh. Andre goes out mountain biking, does he not? A, a, a modest amount. I think so. I, I mean, I also have some land management uh, experience with this. So other considerations for mountain bike use, like, like Alex said, is like the the other user conflicts and and that's particularly problematic in like um, single track situations uh, where there's not very good visibility, probably like the Holyoke range. But um, the other thing is the impacts like, you know, w in wet conditions, they can tear up a trail if there's a lot of use of mountain bikes. Um, and then uh, maybe the biggest one is that mountain bike use can often lead to the, um, illegal trail creation or whatever you want to call it. So once a, a uh, once a trail becomes popular for mountain biking, oftentimes they'll make other networks of trails and they'll use chainsaws and cut stuff and move dirt around and it can get pretty extreme. And there's an area around where I live that it's just a crisscross mesh work of mountain bike trails. And it's not disallowed there, but it's, you know, it's very well utilized by mountain bikes. Um, so those are some other management considerations that I just wanted to bring up. I don't know how much of an issue it is on the Amherst trail system. So um, the idea of regulating it without there being an issue, I, I don't know. I, I am curious is Dave, have you had complaints? Like, have you been out on trails and seen mountain bike erosion damage or? um trail creation where there shouldn't have been any of those i've seen i've seen modest and aaron may have some experience with this too um having grown up here as i did but um certainly there is you you can see some trail impacts as you said michelle during wet conditions you know if you think about many many of our trails go directly through wetlands you know i mean that's the reason we have a lot of our conservation land frankly is it was undevelopable so that means it was wet, it was swampy, et cetera, um, streams and rivulets and whatnot. Um, I think the only the only one that comes to mind, Michelle, was up on the Mount Holyoke Range. We did have a situation in the last three years where somebody was doing some cutting to make some sort of a almost like a a pump track for their kids or something. I I can't recall specifically, but I believe we determined that it was on private property, although it was near one of our trails. It was on private property. I can't remember the details. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of struggling with this one. Like, ooh. I I have seen a little evidence of mountain bike uh, mountain bikes on the Robert Frost Trail, um, particularly. Um, sections in North Amherst going up through by like Flat Hills Road area down towards the Atkins Reservoir and then also um, uh, uh, sort of down in the Lawrence Swamp area. I've seen some evidence of it as well, um, but those are mm -hmm. probably the only places where I've seen it and, and I have seen evidence in those locations that it's, it's damaging the trail in terms of, um, you know, causing... Uh, usually it's going through puddles and they're instead of going through like the center of a puddle, they'll go around the side and then it widens out the trail disturbance um, in those wet spots. The trail ends up getting really wide as a result. Mm. Yeah. I mean, people do that too in foot traffic. Right. You go around the ruts. So, I guess I, I go back to something Michelle said a minute. I mean, the, the question is, is does this rise to the level at this time that we need to regulate it? Or is this kind of a watch 
a watch activity that we need to keep our eyes on. And we can always add a new rule or regulation as needed to this policy. Um, I just still did want to say, I kind of glossed over um, um, horseback riding. And I did say that in general, I don't think we have a lot of horseback riding except on the Mount Holyoke range. I will say from an insurance standpoint and a liability standpoint, I actually think horseback riding is rated one of the most dangerous activities that you can allow on your private or public land. So, I mean, one fall, and we have had issues with dogs, believe it or not, we'll, we'll interface two challenges, but up on the Mount Holyoke range, we did have a situation in the last three years and, and other situations like this where dogs encountered horseback riders on the Mount Holyoke range trails, some of ours, some of DCRs, and uh, someone was thrown from their horse because of the dog barking at the horse. So horseback riding concerns me from a liability standpoint is all I'm saying. So that is, that's a good point. I walk with a horse often and um, we, when we encounter dogs are normally on leash and the owner can contain them but they will go after a horse and when there's like a kid on a horse that becomes a really really dangerous situation that's what this was yeah yep a lot of rocks to fall on on the whole range so mm -hmm. what to do leave it alone mm -hmm. close trails to those uses move on I suggest we don't do anything with the mountain biking. And I, I think I agree with Dave that it doesn't, it's not big enough of a problem and maybe we can revisit it if it becomes one or okay. address it side by side with the horses. I don't know, Dave, do you, I mean, what you just said is kind of concerning is, is there a sign that you can put up or if we write in horses, you know, use this at their own risk, does that absolve liability or I don't know how to manage that. I mean, the easiest way would be to say, we don't allow horseback riding on our trails. Um, that's the easiest and cleanest and easy easiest to enforce. I I would not lose any sleep over that. I I, okay. I think it's a very narrow swath of people who want to ride our trails, and I I think it adds quite a bit to our liability. And I'm sure our insurance company would not really want to hear that, oh, we allow horseback riding on all of our trails on the Mount Holyoke Range. So I'm happy to just say horseback riding is not allowed and let the dust settle and see if anybody really has an issue with that. I'm good with that. And if they do it anyway, I, then well, the, the there's a state liable. park. There's a state park up there that that we interface with on the trails. And if they allow horseback riding and somebody has to cross our property as a in the in the in the course of using the state park, that that creates a bit of a problem. Isn't isn't the ownership checkerboard in places? That's a question for Dave. Dave is frozen to me. Yeah, he looks frozen to me too. Yeah, I mean, if what I know, there are locations on Bay Road where there are trails um, that you can connect from Bay Road up to state property. I'm not sure that that ne necessitates the town taking on the liability of allowing, um, you know, passing through with horses. Um, I don't have an opinion one way or another. Just trying to walk through it. If we say there it's not allowed, and then someone decides to use the crossing point at their own risk, then they they make that decision for themselves. Yeah. I mean, likewise, isn't mountain biking on the Holyoke Range also sort of dangerous and creates its own liability? Just want to be fair to all users here. Um, I, I don't really care. I don't. Dave, think, oh, Dave's not with us anymore. He froze and then disappeared. I mean, what? one thing since we're talking about this that I would support are those the signs maybe on the kiosk that has the triangle of who yields to who, because I think that's just 
good trail etiquette messaging, which is if you do see a horse, and I guess if we're going to say there's no horses, that's one thing, but the bikes must yield to pedestrians. Um, and just so that it's clear how to safely use the trails and, um, you know, if something does go wrong, there's some understanding of fault. That's a good point. Let's hold this until Dave comes back and see what else we can do. While we're here, Aaron, we have a spelling error at number five where it says users should avoid. There's a an extra A in avoid. No, I I think it's the it's um, it's track tra changes. It's because it's track changes. Once you accept it, it'll, that, that A has a line through it. It'll go away. Oh, okay. I can't see the line. Okay. Um, I hear us saying that we should disallow horses. Makes me a little sad, but. I mean, what if we said uh, horse, horse users, tra users use trail at own risk? I don't. Yeah. I'm just, and bikers should too, right? Like, yeah, bikes everybody... and horses use at your own risk. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. Where all users must use I trails would ask at their Dave, risk. I would ask Dave to go to council. Yeah. yeah. Go to council but, and see if that really gets you off the hook. Yeah. It may not. And there may be other parts of this document that council will have to look at anyway. So. Can we flag <laughs> that as a, um, a deeper dive? Yes. Okay, so I'm happy to leave it. The council is going to look at it and give us some advice. Okay, okay moving on, we've got a uh, thing about sort of signage for horses. Then Aaron responded and Bruce responded. We can move down. And then uh, Bruce has a three question mark or four question mark. I it said groups of more than five mountain bikers or horse riders. Well, now that's becoming tied in with the conversation we just had. But my question was, five seemed like a lot. Yeah, well, <laughs> this that was completely arbitrary. It was just to get the conversation okay. started All about right. where, where we would expect a land use application to be triggered. Um, you know, we, we've had this issue a lot, like where, for example, a family is coming to have a picnic. Are they required to have a land use application? Probably not. But if like five families are coming to have a picnic somewhere and they're taking up the whole place, then they probably should have a land use application. So it's really like that finding that sweet spot of like, you know, how many would, would uh, require town notification for us to be aware of it. Yeah. Well, you could easily, you could easily have a family with three or four on bikes. Yeah. You could easily have three or four or even five guys who want to go do the trails on their bikes. So I'd rather have the number large enough that we don't create an enforcement issue because uh, you're never going to be able to enforce that. Well, I, I propose we hold it until we have a, a, a better understanding of about bikes and horses from the council and then we can revisit the number. Well, why don't we settle on a number? Five five is what was there. It may have been to get the conversation going, but I think having three or four is fuzzy. Oh, I just was saying, is it groups of more than three? Yeah, they're married to a family, mom, dad, and one child. Okay. Fine, groups of more than four. Yeah. You're creating a you you're creating a a an administrative cost. You're creating an enforcement okay. issue, which you're probably right. not going to be able to enforce. I withdraw my concern. Leave five the way it is. Five horses, a lot of horses, though. It's a lot of poop on the trails. <laughs> you know, yeah, I think. You know, Aaron, can you make that change? I can't see where it is. I was yeah. just I was just There's gonna more than five. Okay, I, moving on. I was I was just gonna say if it's okay, um we could separate horses and mountain bikes. So, you know, might be groups of more than 
two horses or more than three horses and groups of more than five yeah, mountain bikes. Um, Michelle's comment about um, horse droppings. Um, I commented in here, move it off the trail. Yeah. And, and I agree with the whole there. thing. So let's use it the way it is. I think that's taken care of. Then there's this action item. Um, you're in bold. Where um, I think this comes from Aaron as a committee action item the, to work with which trails are going to allow horses and bikes. So that's on hold. No. I'm hoping to send this to the commission. So, you know, how many of these kinds of situations do we want to hold open? For them, we've, we've got a reduced commission meeting schedule that's pushing everything into December. Huh. On number 16, it was just awkward word reading. I didn't really know how to handle permaculture. And um, so I, what I did is I, I took the business about gathering and put it up front. I think it's fine. In 16. Yeah. Um, the one suggestion I would make there, sorry, I got bounced out of the meeting and couldn't get back in. I don't know why. Um, but I noticed at the end of this, it says, or carried out by the Department now of Conservation. I lost my audio again. Hmm. We, I don't see why we would say carried out by the Con Department of Conservation and Development. I would just say the Conservation Department. I can't hear what Dave's saying. Can you hear me, Dave? Alex? Welcome Alex? To Zoom. Enter your vehicle, followed by pound. Aaron, can you make that change? Yeah, Aaron, you can just edit that, right? It's not I mean, there's no need to broaden yeah, I'm multitasking. It. Could you guys restate what you just said? I said in 16, the last sentence, carried out by the Department of Conservation. We don't need to have the whole functional area in there. It's never referenced like that it shouldn't be referenced this is a conservation department conservation commission um um document so just conservation department yeah i don't know why that was like that that's weird Um, Dave, while Alex is is dialing in, um, yeah. we were we did pause on horses and bikes. Um, mm -hmm. My suggestion was that we just say horses and bikes are used at their your own risk on conservation lands. Um, but uh, there's another section about like um, group use of like mountain bikes and horses and what would trigger a land use application. Um, I think if we just put horses and bikes are used at your own risk, it might kind of address both of those issues at once. Um, but mm -hmm. um, Alex was suggesting that we should check with the town attorney on that. I don't know if you have thoughts to share right now so we can resolve it. Um, just rather than prohibiting saying it's used at your own risk would put the onus on the user. I'm fine with that for now. I'm sensitive to the fact that, you know, as Alex has stated, we're, we're trying to move this forward. So let's keep it moving forward and not hold it up on that point. I mean, this is the big lift is all of these things. If there are things we want to tweak in the future, that can be done fairly quickly. Okay. Well, so, I'm going to, I'm going to highlight those and just say, use at own risk and then we'll, once Alex is back on, once Alex is back online, um, where he can hear, we'll. We can't hear you, Alex. Can you, are you on audio, Alex? I'm on my phone. I'm on my phone. I'm actually on both, but I was losing your audio, so I went to my phone, and now I've got an echo. 
So I'm going to try oh, using my phone. My phone. My phone. Okay. My phone. Um, we only have a couple more minutes. Oh, sorry, Aaron, go ahead. Michelle, is Alex, is, can you add his phone in as an oh. attendee? And we, yes, because I, I can't do it while I'm sharing my screen. Okay, Alex, you, you should be allowed to talk now with your phone. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. So you have, I thought we were going to 130. I have to go at in five minutes, but there is just a couple things I wanted to um, comment on before I go. Yeah, I hope we can get through dogs, um, which is come right here at number 17. There's three paragraphs, or at least I divided them up so that they're really different subjects. Yeah, well, you the big looked. one here is that you've included Wentworth Farms. So that's kind of a big discussion about whether or not we're adding an off-site dog, um, I mean, an off-leash dog site and time. I just wanted to hear from Dave on that one and Bruce and Darren. I, I would not be in favor of adding more off-leash. Uh, I, I, I think it just opens the door even further. Yes, I know we have an enforcement issue at... Um, at Wentworth Farm, but I'm hoping that if we, over the next year or two, engage on some of the common sense um, outreach and education pieces and new signage and a new public awareness campaign, I'm, I don't know, I'm optimistic that that will make some difference, but I, I do not want to open the door wider on off leash. I mean, we spent $300,000 on a brand new dog park. We have 80 miles of trails, more than 80 miles of trails that people can walk their dog on leash. And we have Wentworth Farm, or excuse me, we have Amethyst Brook and Lower Mill River. Um, you know, frankly, one of my thoughts over the last couple of weeks is, you know, if you look at Carol's statistics, Lower Mill River and Mill River Recreation Area, that's where a lot of the negative interactions with, with dogs take place. And I get calls frequently that, that area is so well used. Why do we even have it as an off-leash area? Because there's so many other competing uses down there. Amethyst Brook, right or wrong, good or bad, is a de facto off-leash dog park. I think that door was open years ago, 25 years ago, and very hard to close it. But I, my recommendation would be not to add another area. I agree with Dave on that one. I think uh, sort of succumbing to the pressure isn't the direction that I, I want to see it go. I'd rather try some strategies that we laid out. I, I went I by Amethyst Brook on uh, Sunday at about 10 o'clock in the morning. There was no room in the parking lot. It was absolutely jammed. It was mm. just full. So we are concentrating dog off leash dog use in that area and probably in mill river mm -hmm. which as the numbers grow with dogs running around you kind of so and i'm i'm happy to take out wentworth farm my feeling was that we have an enforcement issue now with people using it and uh, i said why does it hurt to meet them halfway it makes enforcement a lot easier I went to Wentworth Farm one day and everybody I saw had their dog on a leash. Great. And only one data point. But what I was going to say is that uh, I want to go with what Dave is encouraging us to do. Um, okay. And we've okay. talked enough about it. Let's take it out. All right. And and then Alex, just like as from the land management perspective, concentrating the use at those two places is probably a good strategy. So mm -hmm. to lighten it up other places and focus it on some, um, like save some impacts from other sensitive places like Wentworth. So I have to go soon, but, and I'm sorry, I'm just gonna jump to something else where you crossed out, um, don't feed the wildlife. I, I definitely don't wanna cross that out. Like I, mm -hmm. I, agree with your comment but i think a lot of that feeding the wildlife is like squirrels and 
you know, raccoons and, and a lot of the waterfowl at puffers and what people feed the wildlife is not good for the wildlife. And you probably know about, I think it's called like angel wing syndrome. So when like young waterfowl are fed like bread and human food, they have like a musculoskeletal development issue where their wings don't develop properly and they can't fly and they just end up uh, perishing during the winter. So there is big consequences for that. And I just think a blanket, um, don't feed the wildlife is, is the way to go on the conservation lands. So those were the only two items mm -hmm. that I wanted to- Well, where, if, where the was that? To, if the little kid wants to- feed the chickadees they're going to do it anyway so sure yeah. but but there should be a don't feed the wildlife sign at you know and there just should be the policy there and if some kid feeds the chickadees it happens you know yeah. but i i changed my view then i agree with michelle fine let's leave it in thank you for that i don't have a problem with that um mm -hmm. i michelle while you're still here i did put out a blurb uh, uh suggesting that we add some language to having to do with dogs, that we close a trail for a month. Oh, I saw that. If off leash becomes a problem, if dog waste becomes a problem, and the problems that I cited were public health issue or public safety issue. And that yeah. do, as part of the uh, cultural change that we're trying to um, inf uh, inf cause, if we, if we close a trail and nobody can be off leash or just close it to dogs, we will wind for a month or two weeks or whatever it is. We will wind up having people um, uh, speaking to others whose dogs are, are not behaving properly because they'll learn that they will lose the privilege of using the area with their dogs because of other people. So yeah. I wanted some feedback on on the idea of allowing in the rules saying that we will close trails if things get out of hand on those two issues. I'll just give my quick feedback. I, I mean, I inherently like it and I feel like maintain, you know, managing these lands is not unlike parenting. <laughs> so having some kind of consequences made sense to me. I, I wonder about how we would do that. And um, I'll leave that for Dave and Aaron to talk about. Um, but one thing I just want to comment on that I've heard from dog users, especially at Amethyst, is that people are now even reluctant to report issues because they are worried about losing privilege so of dog walking or that it will become a problem. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying that that should ward us from doing anything. I'm just sort of pointing out I don't even know what that would do, if it would make it less safe or whatever. But I, I like the idea of people taking responsibility for the privilege that they have. It's kind of like driving where it's not a right, it's a privilege that we're making this exception to the town bylaw. So, I mean, I'm in favor of it if it's realistic. I just, um, you know, at some point we'd have to say, okay, there is a problem. It reached some threshold. What's the threshold? And how are we going to enforce the closure? So, oh. I mean... It, I'm open to I, it. It's interesting. Can I respond real quickly before just yeah. while you're here? Uh, I think the 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 most likely is dog waste, whether it's bagged and left on the trail. I was in Miniman National Park yesterday, and I doing something else, and I asked them, "Do you have problems with dog off leash and dog waste?" And I hit a button. I got a two and a half minute rendition of I wish there was no dogs allowed in Miniman National Park. And once somebody puts down a green bag with poop in it, everybody else thinks that's the place to put them. And somehow the Park Service is going to come along and pick them up. And the Park Service does not put out receptacles because they don't want to have to empty them. So I think dog waste will probably be one of the triggers because you can walk along and, and look at it. And in terms of how do you enforce it, I see a sign with hinges. So you have a horizontal sign that um, when it's, and it's in two pieces on a hinge and they both flip down and it says dog off leash, 10 to dawn to 10. And then it says something else. Um, the trail will be closed if, if waste is, a problem or something like that so 
all of a sudden the waste is a problem, you just take that sign on the hinge and fold it up. And in the back side says trail closed to dogs. I'm sure that will be ripped off immediately. <laughs> we agree, but I, I think we need to set the policy and let the conservation department do its job to implement it. Well, in the course of writing, I think as as Aaron, I mean, as Michelle said, okay, how do you do this? So it's a natural question to ask if, as one writes, it is the is, uh, Aaron and, and Dave's job to figure out how to do it, but there's an idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess like, you know, as with parenting, if you make a threat, you have to fall through on it or else, you know, your bluff is called. So how realistic is it that we would be able to follow through on this and how much poop i don't i don't know but my my gut is if there's no consequences let's not ever talk about this again i think it's fine to leave i, I think i can't quite envision things getting to that point of closing a trail but frankly amethyst brook we could close it this afternoon if you wanted to what we do is we just close off the parking lot if you can't park you won't go, 90% of the people won't go there. The mayor of Northampton just closed a conservation area or two because of homeless encampments. Now, luckily we have not gotten to that point, but the homeless encampments on conservation land in Northampton got to the point where, and they gave them, I think two months, to advocates and the people living there to move and they didn't move. And then the mayor said, I am closing this conservation area and I went to it just to see, and they closed it off, and people eventually left. But I, I'm not comparing homelessness and dog uses. I, I just use that as an example. It is possible to close these areas to most people if you close the parking areas. That will yeah, that didn't occur to me. Good create point, a pretty it. major, major impediment to being at Amethyst Brook. You can always get to it from other places, and other streets and some people in the neighborhood will just walk there, but most of the people will be not going there and pretty ticked off. But anyway, it's possible to close. It I would mean, be we... nice if we closed it, it would be nice for people to know why mm, and for, for sure. how long. Now, yeah. Maybe you put that on the town website. I don't know. Oh yeah. If we closed any trail or any conservation area, we would have to justify why we're doing it. And I oh. would just, I would just point to the commission and give them Michelle's, a cell phone number, and I would go on vacation. I'd go on sabbatical my, for a couple my home of, address. Um, uh, and Aaron would be on sabbatical, and you know we'd let you all handle it. Uh, yeah, there is oh. the risk of the the overflow if you know you shut the gate that they would go elsewhere. Yeah, that'll um, happen. But so, do I have an agreement to put that language in the rules to allow that to happen if the town um, thinks it's necessary? I'm fine with it. Okay, yeah, I doubt it'll happen, but yeah. So I'll, I'll when I get this back from Erin, I'll add it unless she wants to add it. But I would add it, um, not as a footnote, as I suggested. I'd add it in the text. Is this something that we we would put up like post at a kiosk so that you know the actual users of the trail that aren't going to the town website would understand that they're responsible for the you know keeping the place clean. I think we're going to have to, when this is all done and approved by the commission, my short answer is when this is done, approved, we're going to have to decide what of all these rules and all this text, what actually goes on the kiosks? Because we have a limited amount of real estate on every kiosk. So yeah. can we fit, how much verbiage can we fit and what are the priority things to put on that kiosk? We also don't want it to appear like everything is a no, don't do this. If you do this, you will be, you know, da 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 da. So some of these may be symbols, you know, like whatever, dog poop with a slash sword or whatever. So we've got to work with our sign designer on that. But to your question, Michelle, there would be links and or QR codes on every um, kiosk that would take people to a more extensive explanation and narrative on each conservation layer area, including maybe, you know, more of your, your policy documents. So 
uh, we, we've yet to figure that out. Let's get to the document you all are comfortable with, and then we'll kind of translate to that to what goes on the kiosk. Sure. Can I just say one more thing uh, sure. regarding that? And I got to go. Um, I guess what I really like about what Alex drafted there is that it gets the point of the off leash dog walking is a privilege and not a right on the conservation right. lands. And that like driving, you need to follow the rules to maintain your privilege and, you know, have people take some community and personal responsibility for um, everybody else following the rules and um, picking up trash. And so just sort of that sense of responsibility for your community privilege of the off leash dog walking. And so having that, phrased in some way that um, is is like a positive message about take care of this and your and your privilege because you know it is a privilege and it can be revoked I think that's a good part of the overall message that we're trying to get through to people okay well thank you very interesting discussion I'm sorry to leave but um I'll talk to you guys next week okay. Bye. thanks Michelle in, in the time that remains um, I'd like to move down here. I think we're going to get to hunting pretty soon. And uh, let's see how far we are. Bruce thought that the list of... Uh, at some point, he oh, wanted to put links in, in, a, in an appendix. Um, it just seemed like we were getting finer and finer grained in a regulation document. But I, yeah, I don't... So you are talking about item 22. Yes. Hunting. And um, I, I was just drafting and I stuck them there. Okay. I agree to have access to them. So. What do you say that we send this out to the commission and see, we'll, we'll keep your comment in mind. Okay. Send it out and see what they say. Sure. And, um, I want to there was um there, the second paragraph has to do with wearing blaze orange and the first one has to i want to hold on go to the top please the the bottom has to do with pets and blaze orange uh i'm getting mixed up on what's the top the middle and, and i think that this this here is a middle paragraph where hunters wear 500 square inches, and we recommend that users do too. That's in this paragraph. But right. I want to go up to the top where it says, uh, hold on. I divided this up between fishing and hunting because they're different. My problem that I ran into when I was looking at the maps is uh, I can't differentiate one parcel of Lawrence Swamp from another. And I asked Erin if they're individually named and she was kind enough to give me a map where the name Lawrence Swamp was associated with every parcel rather than Lawrence Swamp A, Lawrence Swamp B, or whatever it might be. So there's no way for me to uh, identify the parcel that doesn't have much of a buffer in it. In, in, if, we, if the criteria was we're going to not allow hunting with shotguns and, and primitive firearms in conservation lands that, that have or overlaid a great deal by the buffer, that part of, of the parcels in Lawrence Swamp have a lot of buffer coverage and perhaps one or two parcels do not, but I can't identify those because they're not, there's no sub name, there's no individual names. So what I have here is a complete elimination of uh, shotgun and uh, primitive firearm hunting and that's the reason because I couldn't I couldn't name the Lawrence Swamp parcels that don't have much of a buffer and mm. just a just a another kind of piece of information there 
my, my understanding is that most of the parcels that are sort of in the in the midst of those um, conservation areas are water department land and those do they do allow hunting on those um, just for reference purposes the water department allows hunting on their lands they do yes um so I, w I wanted to take special care to point out that contrary to our previous discussion it it does i looked at the maps too and i i had the same problem alex did the first line is yellow highlighted where it says not allowed. I just want to make sure I point that out. So essentially what you're saying, Alex, is based on all the maps that were produced in our discussions, the only area that we felt comfortable with continuing to allow hunting with shotguns and primitive firearms was is Lawrence Swamp. But a then couple, a couple of portion parcels of Lawrence Swamp. Right. And 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 you're breaking that up into a couple of parcels because in some areas the safety what are we calling it safety setback or or whatever it is from trails is five hundred foot buffer on either side of the trail if you if we bring up the Lawrence Swamp if we bring up the map that um, Aaron provided you'll see that. A good number of the Lawrence Swamp parcels have um, overlaid by a large buffer. And so I, in, in the process, I asked her to buffer the Shutesbury land, which she did. And um, so we can, we can. Uh -huh come up with names for Aaron are you able to bring up that map I hate afraid? to backtrack Alex but you know this uh, as a hunter you know this much better than I um we landed on 500 feet on either side of a trail was there a strong safety rationale from that I mean that's certainly not statewide I mean that would be you know that's the buffer that Mass Wildlife established as the distance that you have to be from an occupied dwelling, an occupied Ooh. building, mm -hmm. to discharge um, any kind of a firearm or an arrow. Right. Is so, it the same from a public way? Is it 500 feet from a roadway? Well, on our chart it is. On this map, it is. Yeah, I'm just playing the devil's advocate here a little bit. I know, I know that it's 500 feet from a residence, but I guess I, I, I was a little fuzzy on. Did we feel we had a strong rationale for 500 feet? So that's yep. essentially you're taking out a thousand feet along every trail, right? 500 feet this way, 500 feet that way, so a thousand feet swath. Uh, surrounding everyone uh, uh, longitudinally along every one of our trails. There and was no regulatory basis for the for the 500 foot along the trails. Just it was it's mostly just a visual to get a sense of of where that 500 feet falls. Um, well, the, the the regulation comes from Mass Wildlife. There is a regulatory basis. Well, the right, regulation know, but... for for a setback from structure, yes, but not the setback from trail. No, there is there isn't there is no set there's no regulatory setback from trails. The setback is from paved roads, right? And occupied dwelling, occupied right. buildings, right? So, so if, sorry, let me just if you look at the map and you reduce all the purple by half, I don't think it changes the prohibitions that much. Yeah, and Aaron, you've got it. Oh. You'd have to blow it up so people can see where Lawrence Swamp is. That's all those ones in the bottom there. 
But I, I think that even if you cut it by half, it doesn't change very much. Yeah, and then we start to get arbitrary. You know, somebody said, how'd you get that? We can point to mass wildlife. If we go half that distance, um, we have not, no basis to point to. No, I, it was a thought experiment, that's all. Yeah, and and my thinking with designated designating Lawrence Swamp for hunting only was just to have a place where hunters could go and that we put at the trail entrances coming into the Lawrence Swamp to alert hikers, hunting is permitted in the Lawrence Swamp and use caution, wear blaze orange, all those things. Um, but just designating one place because it seems like it's the only, especially with water department land back there and there are some areas where they could, where they, you know, they're 500 feet from from paved roads, they're 500 feet from structures, and there's some significant acreage back there that it might be the um, most expansive location in town where there's multiple land, hold land holdings to designate a location, which wouldn't be to say, yeah, in those locations, there is going to be hunting activity within the 500 foot buffer of the trail. It's an acknowledgement of that just to designate a specific area so that it's not an all out prohibition just as a suggestion, but I'm, I'm not married to the idea. It was mostly just to keep us moving and not get at an impasse. Mm. Yeah, there's, we're by, if we, you know, first of all, I'm not comfortable drifting away from the 500 foot buffer because I can, Point to mass wildlife as as a buffer that they feel is and that's the rule they came up with it they have a reason i feel arbitrary if i do something else because then i get into well why isn't it a yard off every trail or two yards and then it just becomes i i hear you alex but one could argue that and I agree, like us cutting it in half, it's 250 feet or whatever is arbitrary. But one could argue that we're being arbitrary in applying something that applies that mass wildlife who has the expertise in all things hunting and fishing, they applied that only to uh, 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 right, rights of way, public rights of way and occupied dwellings. So we are arbitrarily applying that to trails. Right. You know, I'd be, I frankly, I mean, looking at this map, I'm like, how do we, you know, there's a couple of green areas and some of the other shaded areas uh, in whatever that is, light green or yellow, um, that are water, water supply protection um, lands. But to me, it'd be simpler just to say we don't allow hunting because how do we, are we going to actually like this, this, breaks up parcels so are we going to post land that you know part of a parcel is huntable and part isn't no we've we've already covered that dave we're not going to do that what are we going to do it's it's well i'm thinking about where a a named parcel is one block and i think lawrence swamp is is one of the is the only one that's multiple blocks so I'm um, I'm confused. How do we communicate this to the public? Well, it's either um, allow allow either the three choices. Come up with different names for Lawrence Swamp parcels. Lawrence Swamp North, Lawrence Swamp East, Lawrence Swamp South, Lawrence Swamp whatever just for example, or um, disallow Lawrence Swamp along with every every other parcel and put on the website, hunting's not allowed on conservation land, period. Right. But then we're going to have the exact same problem up on parcels on the Mount Holyoke Ranch. Um, like I'm looking yep. at the one smack dab in the middle where it says Lawrence Swamp. So you have the trail going through you have the gray area, right? 
Um, and just above that is that little green swath, which is presumably huntable, but it's just that small portion of the um, of the parcel, our green parcel. You mean where there's a buffer? Right so here, the only, right here. Um, Aaron, I think you have the cursor, right? I uh, know above that, above that next one up, that one. So yeah, all, I'd say the one so, she's got her hand on now is well buffered. The one just above it has a, a tiny corner and I would ignore right. it. I have to step away for one second. Yeah, but that's what I mean. How would we, it looks like a, a sixth of that parcel is huntable and the rest isn't. Hey, Alex, um, as a practical matter, when you're out there hunting, how easy is it for you to know that you're 500 yards from the trail? We're not going to post the 500 foot buffer. Yeah, it's impossible to do that. So it's not easy to know. No. No, and we also need legal clearance on how do we how do we announce this? Is it the only way it's announced now is on the website? And that's worked for years. And not all parcels allow hunting, only select. Mm. And the town has been happy with announcing that on the website for decades. So Yeah, we used to post annually, as I said, we would post every trailhead with hunting regulations and seasons and yeah, I don't know. I'm just maybe I don't have the head mindset for this today, but I'm I'm struggling with the practical implications of this. Well, um, the issue oh. is public safety. The yeah, issue is not practical. Not practical considerations come later, but the 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 rationale is to not have an accident. So it seems like where we're going is we're just going to ban hunting in Amherst. I mean, should can we just move forward and say that? I mean, can that's what it, that's the way it's written right now because it couldn't yeah. break out Lawrence Swamp. Yeah. So I think we should just, if that's the case, if that's what the committee is recommending, we go with that and bring it to the commission and and because we're I feel like we are going in circles talking about it. Um, I we should ask the commission and then if it if it still stays in, there's a public hearing. And if significant numbers of hunters want to come and complain about it, they will. And then we can discuss what to do about that. Mm -hmm. That's January, February, March, no, after yeah. December. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I think I, I want to get the Aaron, rest of it. Yeah. If we can go back to the document, I wanted to make sure this got airtime. Aaron is right, though, if we're moving in that direction for what you say, Alex, which is public safety, then fine. Um, we will have to we will have to prepare because I think I can predict there will be some sort of a backlash. So you remember I looked at Concord Lincoln in Northampton mm -hmm. and they were there ahead of us. And there's only one area that Northampton allows firearms and that's uh, a conservation area out right on the river. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I have no, no so moving down. Space. What do we got? Um, Aaron. We're coming up on one thirty, and I want to talk about, um, this going to the commission at its next meeting. And there's a there's a <laughs> there's the issue of bow hunting. And I don't think there's many people that hunt birds with bows. Some people hunt turkeys with bows. But I really don't think somebody's gonna try and take a peasant out of the air with an arrow. Um it's because I was worried a bit. It says archery will be allowed on all units. So we're not disallowing archery. Why and, aren't we? Um, we'll wait to see what comments come back. So hunting with archery is not going to change one iota. I guess I, in that meeting with the commission, I might argue if we're really going for 
truly, you know, the value we're looking for is public safety, then why are we allowing any hunting on conservation land? Well, Dave, I hear you. In drafting, I was not comfortable going for the max. Mm -hmm. I would rather have comments come back to that effect so that it is the group speaking, not me. Yeah, no, I, I totally understand that. Um, I think where we're going to have to be more solid is if I think a lot of people will actually be very enthusiastic about this and very supportive. I think I think many, many users in Amherst will be like, ah, this is great. Um, the naysayers or one of the places we're a little vulnerable on would be one, if we allow archery uh, bow hunting and not uh, the others, because I think truly if we're, we're basing this on public safety, why not just ban it all? And then two, when people say, what are your statistics for, you know, what incidents have happened on Amherst conservation land that you are basing this on? We are shrugging our shoulders because we don't why have do we, it. My answer would be, why do we have to wait for there to be somebody to be hurt? Be with Alex. And you could look at statistics in all the other towns of the valley and see what you came up with. Because what's the difference just because you cross a town line? I I don't know for sure, but I'm, again, I'm not advocating for hunting. It would be much simpler for me and the department to just ban it all. Um, but I'm just saying we don't have a lot of data to support this. Yeah. And I bet other towns don't either. Cause well, when I'm up on the firing range on the Holyoke, on the, whole, the, the gun range, shooting skeet with my friends, they're all hunters. And if I talked to them about closing hunting on conservation land, they'd all turn their back on me and not talk to me anymore. Ah, ah. Yeah. Oh, so, you know, I, it's not, there's a lot of purple. Yeah. yeah. No, I get it. I get it. So I'm gonna need I just wanted to make sure that got plenty of airing because I would like this document, if you all will agree to, for this to be loaded for, after we get done with the comments um, is is to accept all changes and get rid of all comments and put it in the on the on the website for the commission to review and comment on and see what they have to say and move this along i agree to sending it to the commissioners and just say there's two or three points we're still not sure of but we need you to read I gotta go. Okay. Okay. Erin, your your picture is on there and you have such a nice smile. I had to laugh when I first got on because that's the first thing I saw. Um I don't know if you guys can see, you know, you can see the picture of her. Well she you know, she left to go deal with her sick child, so she may not hear what oh, you're no, saying. No, I'm here, I'm back. All right. Yeah, there was... sorry, I gotta go. All right, I think okay. we Hi, all Bruce. do. So we all didn't right. cover our next agenda, but I'll just pick up where we left off and create one for Aaron. Yeah, Sounds just good. send me the agenda items. And also, Alex, if you could send me the items that are um, going to be on the upcoming agenda, because I'm getting ready to post it. Um, the things you want to bring to vote and the things you want to have for review. Yeah. So I'm not the memo that I sent out. I want to give Dave time to look at that if he could, uh, in his when he finds a moment, read through it, and um, but not wait till the next meeting of the of the subcommittee. What's mm -hmm. wrong, Jack? Come on in. Oh, all right. Sorry. I think we all got to go, but thank you. Bye bye. All. Thank you very much. Thanks, Aaron. Okay. Thank you. Bye.